dedicated to the strength of the nation. Proudly, we hail. Yes, proudly we hail, starring Barry Sullivan in the Martin and the McCoys, a United States Army and United States Air Force presentation. Now here is our producer, the well-known Hollywood showman, C.P. McGregor. Thank you, thank you, and greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your theater of stars, where your motion picture favorites join us for your entertainment in plays we know you'll enjoy. Our star is that capable actor, Barry Sullivan, and the title of our play, The Martins and the McCoys. This is a gay comedy of New York theater life, the story of the people that make up the behind-the-scenes world and whose efforts bring entertainment to the great white way, along with jealousies, heartbreaks, and feuds. We'll have our curtain for Act One of The Martins and the McCoys after this timely and important message from Wendell Niles. When a man wears the uniform of the United States Army or the United States Air Force, he puts on pride with his clothing. Pride in his job, in the service of which he is a part, in himself and in his country. Wherever the uniform appears, honor goes with it, and the understanding that the uniform of a soldier or airman of the United States is a symbol of freedom and democracy. These are facts to be remembered by all of us. The uniform of the United States is proud and honorable wherever it is worn. Back to the microphone, our producer. The curtain rises on the first act of our gay comedy, The Martins and the McCoys, starring Barry Sullivan as the young man who witnessed most of the feudin', fussin', and fightin' Johnny Bates. The Martins and the McCoys were feudin' mountain boys, only the mountains happened to be the spires of Manhattan. Yes, it was somewhere in the vicinity of Times Square that Xander Martin, fabulous European and Broadway empresario and proud discoverer of stars, vowed the professional destruction of Steve McCoy, who had provided personal management for many of Broadway's outstanding luminaries. And furthermore, the eccentric Xander was succeeding in his efforts, much to the consternation of Johnny Bates, publicity director for Steve McCoy. For Johnny wanted to marry Steve's lovely secretary, Nancy. And how could he when Xander was fast putting his means of a livelihood out of business? On the morning our story begins, Nancy is very excited as Johnny enters the office. Hello, Angel. Oh, Johnny. Quick, boss wants to see you. Oh, he does, eh? Right away. Uh, let me check my calendar and see if I'm free. Johnny, don't joke. He hit the ceiling this morning like a toy balloon. I'll drag him back down, honey. Tell me what's happened. Well, for one thing, the greatest dancer since Pavlova is back in town, LaRue. Oh, no kidding. I get my car back then. She's dancing down with the keys herself. Did she get married, I hope? She got married. Who's the unfortunate victim? I don't know. It's all hush-hush. <laughs> That's the boss, Johnny. Yes, Mr. McCoy? Where's that Johnny? He just got down, Mr. McCoy. I'll send him in. Hurry up, Johnny. No, not until you say it. I love you. Now, will you please no, go... No, 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 not like that. With feeling. I love you. You are an angel. Johnny, get in here. I'm coming, Steve. Goodbye, sweetie. Bye. Where the devil have you been, Johnny? It's came 30. I was at the automat. The automat? Yeah, the automat. They were having a special on stewed figs. I ate three dishes, 19 stewed figs. Oh, sit down, Johnny. No stale gags this morning, please. No, on the level. I ate that many stewed figs. You see, I like figs. All right, Johnny, all right. Hey, what's wrong with you this morning? Xander Martin. Oh, what's our cute friend up to now? The Beast from Budapest is putting a new musical in the works. That's news. Yes, he's already planning auditions for his chorus. Well, what's so depressing about that? Well, I understand Xander has a hit show lined up, and further, the lead role is a dancer. Oh? And it should go to LaRue. But you and I know it won't, not as long as I represent her. No. Say, Stevie, tell me something. How did you and Xander ever start getting into each other's hair? You really want to know? Of course I do. Shoot. I won 100 bucks from him in the gin rummy game. <laughs> no. Mm-hmm, so help me. <laughs> That was the start of it. I blitzed him three straight and made him pay up on the spot. That was doing the wrong thing to Xander. You know how he loves that Fort Knox letter. <laughs> you should have seen his face. The memory is priceless. <laughs> I can imagine. That guy is so tight, if he owned a lumber yard, he wouldn't give a grain of sawdust to a starving termite. I can say that again. 
But Xander is the only the half of it. LaRue is back in town. Yeah, I understand she's dancing down here now with the keys to my car. You know, that's what I don't understand, Johnny. I do everything in the world for that girl, even lend her your car to get married in. Yes, you're so generous with my things. Oh, but don't you see what I mean? And what does she do in return? The minute she gets back in town, she keeps hounding me. Well, maybe wedded bliss doesn't have the magic she thought it would have. Hey, who'd she marry anyway? Oh, I don't know. The only thing she'll tell me is that he's a uh, socialite from Boston. Oh, now I get the hush-hush. Before they announce their marriage, he's got to get an okay from three generations of tombstones. Yeah, uh, something like that. But anyway, LaRue's on her way down here. That's why I wanted you in. First, now, don't mention Xander's new show to her or I'm dead. I won't even think about Xander's new show. Second, I want you to tell her you're working out a big publicity deal for her. I'll tell her I'm trying to get her the cover of the Fish Market Gazette. Now, nah, don't wisecrack. I've got to keep her happy. She's the, she's the only important client I have left. Yes? Miss LaRue is here. Oh, she is? Well, tell her to come right in. The nightmare is here. For heaven's sakes, be nice here. Oh, LaRue, darling. Come right in. Come right in. Hello, Stevie and Johnny, darling. Well, this is quite a reception. Welcome home, LaRue. Oh, Johnny, I want to thank you for letting me use that little old convertible of yours. <laughs> I gave the keys to Nancy. Uh, how'd you make out, LaRue? Well, it rattled like mad, but it <laughs> served the purpose. I wasn't plagued by a single autograph hound. Not one, mind you. Well, <laughs> isn't that lovely? Yes, but then who would think that LaRue would be riding in that junk heap? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, well, uh, LaRue, do tell us every exciting detail of your marriage. We were surmising that you might be delaying the announcement of your wedding because of your husband's family. Why, how did you know? <laughs> oh, Johnny, I wish I could tell you all. I know you're mad to release it to the press. If you knew how mad I was, LaRue. But I will tell you about our three-day honeymoon. And I'm sorry, Johnny, you can't even release that. Oh, darn it all, can't I? Uh-oh, sorry. We spent our honeymoon in Connecticut in a little out-of-the-way cottage camp called Cupid's Nest. Oh. Oh, Cupid's nest. <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> Someone have a match. Uh, oh, yes, of course, of course. Here, LaRue. Oh. oh, thank you. Well, I can't tarry. Must do some shopping. But uh, what are you doing for me these days, TV? Oh, I have several things I want to talk to you about, LaRue. Uh, when you get settled. No, oh, I'm quite settled as far as that goes. Johnny here is going all out on some big publicity for you. That's right, LaRue. I'm going to get you a plug in the drama column of the Cucamonga newsletter. <laughs> Sweet boy. Mm. Well, that's very nice, Stevie, but I was thinking about work. You know? Oh, you've been working too much lately anyway, LaRue. That's evidently what Stevie thinks. I hope you change your mind, Stevie, before it's too late. Before I change mine. Well, see you later. Oh. Yeah, you see what I mean? She's on the war path and we're liable to lose her. Yeah, all she needs is a good excuse. Well, anyway, she doesn't know about Xander's new show yet. Not yet, at least. But when she finds out, I'm well, afraid... Well, who knows? If the beast from Budapest has a big fat part and he needs a good dancer, maybe he'll bury the hatchet and ask for LaRue. Oh, pipe dreams, my boy. Yes? Xander Martin is on the phone. What? Well, put him on. It's Xander. What did I tell you? Hello? Hello, Steve. Long time no Steve, huh? <laughs> You get it? <laughs> yeah, yes, I get it. Uh, what do you want, Xander? Well, I have a little business to discuss. You may call on me today. All right, Xander. I'll be right over. Xander. He wants to see me. I was right then, Steve. The Beast wants LaRue for his show. I knew he wouldn't carry a grudge that far. Let's hope you're right. Anyway, don't forget that hot idea for some publicity for LaRue. I'm off to Xander's. Hello, Angel. What is it, Johnny? Uh, would you have lunch with me? Oh, I'd love to. I've got to dream up a hot idea for Stevie. you got to get it back to him at 2 o'clock this afternoon. What do you want me around for, then? Oh, darling, I do my best dreaming with you. Well, Steve, how did you make out with your beloved Xander? Oh, rotten. You were wrong, Johnny. I was a sucker to even go near his office. Why, what happened? After keeping me waiting about an hour, this tired-out piece of strudel ushers me into his office and raves on for ten minutes about what a great part this will be for LaRue. Hey, this sounds exciting. And then? Then he said he just might cast her in the part. Oh, go on, go on. I'm chewing my fingernails. But he didn't relish dealing with her representatives. Oh, uh, meaning you? Meaning me. I asked him why. He said he couldn't talk the same language, having not yet learned how to bray like a mule, so I... Yeah, 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 yeah. And what did he do after you hit him? Well, I guess he hit the floor. I didn't wait to see. You mean you didn't even wait to see if he bounced? How inconsiderate. You know, I think he'd use LaRue if it weren't for me. Now, Stevie, don't claim to be sidekick. Yes? It's LaRue on the telephone. Oh, oh, put her on. It's Miss Facelift of 1947. 
Hello, LaRue, darling. Hello, Stevie. I'm not interrupting anything important, am I? Why, no, dear. And aren't you sweet? What can I do for you? You can chat with Zandor Martin, dear. He's casting for a new musical now. Or had you heard? Oh, I know all about it, and I'm working on it. Well, see that you do, Stevie, darling. Or else. Goodbye now. She knows? Yeah. Johnny, maybe I ought to unload LaRue. Maybe I ought to let her go. Are you crazy? But I really think Xander would use it. All right, so maybe he would. Look, you've spent a lot of time building up that Terps of Korean tramps. You ought to be grateful to you for that. Oh, now, Johnny, can the campfire girl stuff? Well, I mean it. She should be. And I'm not going to stand here and allow it. Besides, I've got that hot idea you were looking for, and I need LaRue for it. Well, let's have it. Oh, you're going to love this. It's going to make LaRue forget all about losing the part in Xander's show. And at the same time, it's going to even a lot of scores for you with the Beast of Budapest. Sounds almost atomic. It is atomic. Well, shoot. Well, first you'll have to admit something. Getting space for anybody and anything these days is tough. Uh, it's tough, all right. All right. Now, how would LaRue like six pages in the National Picture Magazine Glance? Six pages in Glance? Count them. Six delicious picture-filled pages. Why, LaRue would love it, of course. But you must be out of your mind. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to get six pages in Glance because Xander Martin has long touted himself as a famous discoverer of stars. That guy couldn't discover a star in the middle of the desert at midnight. I won't argue with you, but he does make a claim for discovering many stars, doesn't he? He also makes a claim for being a human being. And he's just about to audition dancers for the chorus in his new show. And so what? So I'm going to slip LaRue right into that line of dancers waiting to be auditioned, unnoticed, unheralded. Hey. Hey, do you get it? There's a line of 200 girls waiting to try out. Wow. The beast runs through him like mad with his characteristic dourness. I see it all unfolding. He's trying to keep from paying the piano player overtime. Oh, right. He rushes him through. LaRue is on stage only for a moment. But long enough for the cameraman to load up with pictures. Right. And a short time later, there it is. Six pages in glance. The famous discoverer of stars turns down the greatest dancer in America for a job as a lowly hoofer in the chorus. Johnny, can it be done? It certainly can. Johnny, so help me. If you do this, I'll write you into a piece of this firm. Well, Stevie, you better get out the ballpoint and start scribbling. Pause briefly from our story, The Martins and the McCoys, starring Barry Sullivan, to bring you an important message from your government. These are simple basic qualifications which you are about to hear. But if you fill these qualifications, you will have the opportunity of a lifetime before you. Listen carefully. If you are between the ages of 20 and 26 and one half, unmarried, with two years of college, or the ability to pass an equivalent examination, and if you are physically fit, you may be able to become an aviation cadet in the United States Air Force. You may be able to take the training that will teach you to fly the best aircraft in the world with the best Air Force in the world, the United States Air Force. And after you have successfully completed a full year of training, you'll receive a commission as second lieutenant in the Air Force Reserve, and you'll have your pilot's wings. If you're among the highest in your class, you'll receive a regular commission, and you'll be on your way to a career with unlimited horizons. For full details, visit your nearest Air Force base or recruiting station at once. The curtain rises on Act Two of The Martins and the McCoys, starring Barry Sullivan as Johnny Bates. Famed European and Broadway producer Zandor Martin self-styled discoverer of stars is auditioning hoofers for the chorus of his new musical, which gave Johnny Bates, publicity director for Steve McCoy, an idea of atomic proportions. The idea is to give this international heel a hot foot by planting the famed dancer LaRue in the line of Corrine's auditioning for Xander's show. Meanwhile, Glance, the national picture magazine, will photograph the self-styled discoverer of stars turning down the most famous dancer in America for a lowly job in the chorus. As we continue our story, Johnny enters Steve's office. Hi, Steve. Did you call the room? I called her. And is the kid happy with the idea of getting six pages in glance? Is she happy? She was so excited when I told her about it, I thought she was going to catch her double chin in the telephone cord. Good. Then I can get started. I got a couple of things to do. Like what? Like lining this up with Phil Smith over at glance. What? You mean you haven't even... Oh, it won't be hard, I hope. <laughs> Oh, there you have it, Phil. Well, what do you say? Um, uh, Johnny. Yeah? I, uh, don't 
think... No. I don't think I ever heard of a greater idea. You mean you go for it? I think it's wonderful. That phony should have been exposed a long time ago. Oh, you associate Xander with an upset stomach, too, eh? Why, that two-bit bum. <laughs> Once I had a photographer over there giving one of his shows $10,000 worth of publicity, yeah. so the guy happens to spill a cup of coffee on one of Xander's costumes. <laughs> well, Xander gets it cleaned and sends me the bill. Hey, we better go over and spill another cup right now. <laughs> I just happen to think we may have trouble arranging this with Xander. Why? He never shied at having his picture taken yet? Yeah, but nevertheless, he's put out the word positively no advanced publicity on his new show. Oh. Oh. Well, cross your fingers. Come on, let's go face the beast of Budapest. <laughs> Sander can give to you five minutes, not a second more. Oh, thank you. You are fortunate. I have at times delegated to the guillotine those who have interrupted my rehearsal. Well, now... Quiet. I... You! Yes? Yes, maestro. Yes, maestro. You must be new here. Run, don't walk to the drugstore across the street. Yes, maestro. Bring to me a Swiss cheese on dry and make sure it is the special. 25 cents with coleslaw. Yes, maestro. And tell them more potato snips or I will do business elsewhere. Well, why do you wait? Yes, Maestro. The boy in here, it is more quiet. You now have four minutes. A minute has transpired. It is about some publicity, no? That's right, yes. Phil Smith here of Glance wants to give your new show six pages. That's right. I'd like to do a layout showing you selecting the girls for your chorus. That is most kind of you. But I have already decided on a plan. No advanced publicity. And why are you so generous to out of the blue sky? Why? Because you, Xander, in the eyes of the public at large, are the magnificent discoverer of stars. That is the mild way of putting it. People flock into your shows to see stars of tomorrow. True, true. Now, we want to take these pictures of you auditioning for your chorus, choosing the great names of tomorrow. That's right. We want to preserve that in pictures for posterity. Xander bows to posterity. Tomorrow I am selecting. You may have an hour between two and three tomorrow afternoon. Thank you, sir. And now your boy smoke? Well, don't mind if I do. Uh, not you... the cigars. Here is a folder of matches for each of you. Oh, thanks. Uh... Not at all. Well, back to work. See you tomorrow, boys. And don't keep Sandra waiting. Where is my fifty dollars? We won't keep him waiting, will we, Phil? <laughs> I'll say we won't. <laughs> hey, I just happened to think, Johnny. What if the genius spots LaRue? He could, you know. Ah, no, not a chance. No? When LaRue comes on stage for her audition, Xander takes his glasses off. He can't see a foot in front of him without those glasses. And how do we get him off of him? Oh, why, Phil, Xander photographed so badly wearing glasses. Didn't you know? Well, slap my wrist. I'd forgotten all about that. Johnny, I think you're a genius. We'll know tomorrow. <laughs> I don't like standing in line. Not so loud, the room. You're next up. Besides, will I look glamorous in the pictures, dressed in this flimsy little rehearsal skirt? Baby, you'd look glamorous in burlap. Now remember, if he should ask you to talk, talk Brooklyn. All right. And if he should ask you to dance, don't dance good. You're next now. I've got to go over with Xander. Well, Phil. Johnny. And Xander. How long must this go on? I'm getting slap happy from flashbulbs. Oh, the torture won't last much longer, will it, Phil? <laughs> <laughs> not much, not much. I'm glad you took your glasses off, Xander. You don't know how they age you. Uh, next. Get the next girl out here. Here she comes, Johnny. And I know it. You will say something. Quick. Say something? What am I supposed to do? A mode all over the place or dance? That is enough. You will dance. <laughs> Hold it! Hold it! Where are my glasses? Why? What? There is great talent here. I sense it in the rhythm of her dance, in the timbre of her voice. Where are my glasses? Uh -oh. Here you are, Maestro. There. there. I want to see. Wait. It is. La Rue. <laughs> so it is. Well, I'll be running along. Wait a minute. Somebody is trying to make of Xander a stunk. Steve McCoy, the lady sabotage. Call the police before I commit homicide. Call the police. Out of my way, Johnny. 
I got to get some pictures down to a magazine. That man is sensational. But, Phil, you're not going to print this. I've got to, Johnny. This oh. is a story that tops personal feeling. We gave Xander the ball 10 yards behind the goal line, and he ran for a touchdown. When it comes to talent, the man is intuitively great. That's all. Oh, brother. When that magazine comes out. <laughs> Sugar. Hello, Johnny. I see you've got a copy of Glance, too. Yeah, what a break for Xander. The man notoriously nearsighted without his glasses, but who immediately sensed the great talent of LaRue. Oh, nuts. I still think he was tipped off. Where's Steve? With the lawyers. Xander still claims he's going to make LaRue dance in the chorus with the other $75 a week girls. Oh, brother. What do the lawyers say? They say he can that LaRue's appearance at the tryouts was a declaration of contract on her part. Well, you know how lawyers are. Yipe. What about LaRue? She's got her lawyers waiting to get her out of her contract with Steve. Brother, when I create trouble, I don't stop until I've turned out a major catastrophe, do I? Anything else happen? Yes. A very angry man was here. Huh? He left this envelope for Xander, strangely enough. He said he couldn't keep it. It might put him up in another income tax bracket. Yeah. He said he was a bellhop at the Cupid's Rest Motel in Connecticut. A bellhop at the Cupid's Rest Motel? Mm hmm, that's right. That's funny. Big hearted Xander gave me a folder of matches from the Cupid's Rest Motel. And that's where LaRue was married. Wait. What? Boston is a suburb of Budapest. What, your mind? No, not at all. Everything's beginning to add up. Listen, c call Steve McCoy and tell him everything is lovely. Johnny! I mean it. I'll be back as fast as I can. And have your hat on, honey. You're going to marry Steve McCoy's new partner as soon as he gets back. Steve's partner? Yeah, and that's me. Let me have that envelope and the, the, the bellhop left. I can't wait to give it to Xander. What are you doing here? If you're coming to beg for terms? Not beg, Xander. Dictate. <laughs> First, you will not present LaRue as a Corrine in your new show. Oh, no? What makes you think not? Because she's your wife. It's not true. But how did you find out? I've got a stooge at the Cupid's Rest Motel in Connecticut. He sent you this letter. Heads or tails? Did he send love and kisses too, Xander? Tripe. Ingrate. All right, you. LaRue and I are married. But you and Steve McCoy played right into my hands. Yeah, that's what you think. What is Joe Public going to say? Joe Public? Yeah, when he finds out the fabulous Xander was trying to pocket the agent's commission on his wife's services that he and his wife contrived to disguise and to misrepresent the facts. And more important, what will the public think of LaRue after this, Sander? Hey, uh, I think you should start dictating. Well, I don't want much, Sander. My partner, Steve McCoy, and I will take care of the talent for the entire show. That is agreeable. As a matter of fact, if things look all right, we might take a portion of the show, say, uh, 50%. Likewise. LaRue will star. Did Steve give you a price on her? No, but I assume... Well, that... whatever price he thought he was going to give you, double it. Uh, well, I'll be running along. Xander! Where are you, Xander? Isn't that LaRue, Xander? Eh, uh, my wife. Coming, coming. Well, hurry up! All this in the wife, too. Xander, I think you have made of Xander a stunk. <laughs> Johnny. Yes, my pet? What was in the envelope? Well, Xander opened the letter and a dime fell out. Gee. Yeah, Xander's getting more generous with his tips. He used to just give him an autograph and say, save it, it'll be worth a fortune someday. But why did the bellhop bring it up to you? I lent my car to LaRue to get married, didn't I? He traced the license number. You know, it pays to do favors for people. It certainly does. And that's why I'm going to do a great big favor for you and let you marry me. Well, aren't you sweet? Well, anyway, lucky. You are sweet. And uh, put your head on my shoulder. Hmm? Tell me some more. Like this? Mm-hmm. Mm. I love you, Johnny. That's what I want to hear. The curtain falls in the final act of the Martins and the McCoys. Our star, Barry Sullivan, will return for a curtain call after this timely message from Wendell Niles. This is important. The United States Army and the United States Air Force are expanding rapidly. 
With that expansion has come an urgent need for more physicians and dentists in the services. Especially attractive opportunities are open to qualified professional men. For instance, if you are a practicing physician, surgeon, or dentist, you may be commissioned in the grade for which you are qualified with $100 per month professional pay in addition to the normal pay and allowances of your grade. And while you are serving with the young men who are serving our country, you will have available to you the vast resources of Army and Air Force medical research facilities. Physicians and dentists who are interested should write at once to the Surgeon General, United States Army, Washington 25, D.C., for full details. Now, once again at the microphone, our star, Barry Sullivan, and our producer. It can only happen in Hollywood. An actor, newly arrived from Broadway with an imposing list of stage hits to his credit, can remain under wraps for three and a half years on a studio contract, then suddenly find himself an overnight sensation and discovery of the year when loaned to another studio. That's what happened to our star, Barry Sullivan. Well, of course, C.P., the fact that it was a million-dollar production, the first in that bracket for Allied Artists, by the way, that didn't hurt any. And the picture was suspense. That's right. From that beginning, Barry, you now do two or three productions a year for Allied Artists. Well, that's right, C.P., but I'm not under exclusive contract. I freelance. Yes, I know, and your latest is Last of the Bad Men. I've been watching your publicity. <laughs> you know, C.P., that's my first Western. I've been wanting to do one for years. The King Brothers produced it, Marjorie Reynolds is in it, Broad Crawford. It's quite a nice cast. And now that I've done one, the fact is I really like to do Western. And the fan mail you get. Well, I'll certainly admit that, C.P., and you know how important fan mail is to us. You know, there's something about the mail I get from the folks who enjoy Westerns. It's, it's, it's down to earth, sincere. That's exactly the way we feel from response in radio. Now back to another picture of yours from Paramount. Oh, you mean The Great Gatsby. Well, that's a screen adaptation from the famous book by F. Scott Fitzgerald, and I think it has one of the best casts of the year. Alan Laird heads it, he plays Gatsby, and gives his best performance since this gun for hire. Betty Field's in it, McDonald Carey, Ruth Hussey, Elliot Nugent directed it, Dick Maybaum produced it. It's a good picture. <laughs> well, you certainly are in no danger of being typed, are no, you? No, C.P., freelancing really gets me around. And speaking of getting around, it, it, you know, it's been a pleasure to appear on your very fine show here in the Theater of Stars. By the way, C.P., what's doing here next with you? First, the pleasure of your appearance is all ours. And next week, Barry, and ladies and gentlemen, Audrey Totter makes a most welcome return before our proudly we hail microphone in a dramatic portrayal titled The Templeton Castle. It is the story of infinite love, of bitter jealousies, of deceit, and warm human emotions. Well, that should be a good show, and I'll be dialing it. Goodbye, C.P. Goodbye, Barry. <laughs> be sure to join us next week, ladies and gentlemen, when we bring you Audrey Totter in The Templeton Castle. Until then, this is C.P. McGregor saying thanks for listening and cheerio from Hollywood. <laughs>